All right, recording. What's up, everyone? Lumid Live, episode number five. We are it's almost, but it's called Lumid Live. Are we still calling it live? I think so. Even though it's not live. Yeah. We're almost on our second hand with these episodes, but today we have a very special guest on the show. But- Alas, uh, this person today is a, a, a very influential per- person. Um, Persian? I, I like to consider him as quite a philo- philosophical thinker. He's an artist. He's a photographer. Um, he's got a great following of people online um, who have attended workshops. Uh, he's very inspirational in the way that he challenges people to think and view their world, but he's also huge on getting community around him. He's well known as the hairy half of Bailey and Moore. So today we spoke to him about what life might look like post uh, this lockdown, but also what we can be doing, some of the challenges that we need to start thinking about getting our mind in the right space to be solving the problems uh, that we have before us. That's right. So without further ado, here's some of the conversation that we had with Sai earlier today. Hope you enjoy. If you have any comments or questions, please pop them in the comment box below. This is a pre-recorded conversation with Sai, so we won't be able to respond to your questions live, but we will be sure to address them just by chatting to you online. So hope you enjoy and we'll see you after. Happy, happy, um, happy virus 2020, guys. Yeah. How, how's your how's your lockdown going? Oh, lockdown's going great. Lockdown's yeah. going sweet. Um, we've worked our way through baking everything you can bake. Um, obviously, flowers in short supply because the whole world's baking. And then we're just back to normal food, not eating crazy baked goods seven meals a day, not not doing too much day drinking. Not too much. Um, oh, that's all relative. What what's what's too much in the in the relative world of the moors? I mean, often an often an evening an evening drink would be by the fire would be normal. COVID has seen that creep forward to be like oh five o'clock, and then you're like three o'clock, and then it's like <laughs> it's like should we do should we do lunchtime beers one day a week? And once you've done lunchtime beers, you're just like, oh, this is very European. Maybe we should be doing this every lunchtime. Yeah. And yeah, before you know it, yeah. Because everyone just asks when you do these things, oh, how are you going with lockdown? And I think we're going to get to the point where we figure out how to do lockdown pretty well, and then they they take it off. The difficult thing is always uncertainty. Uncertainty is the enemy, you know? Um, yeah. And there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty at the moment. But then we're just getting a feeling of certainty being locked down. And then we're going to change the rules again, and uncertainty is going to be introduced. If you said locked, we've, we've got locked down for six weeks, by now we'd go, okay, we've figured out how to do it. We've figured out how to work from home. We've figured out how to navigate all the things we have to navigate. And it might feel like a disaster, but we're navigating it. There's a bit of certainty. Introducing the old game into it again, which is like, hey, we're going to change the rules again. More uncertainty. Yeah. It's a difficult, difficult thing to lead your way through. I hate to use the word the word pivot, but you've got, you know, maybe half of the companies in the world, from small to large, just panicking and on life support, and you've got the other half who just who have got good succession planning, good crisis planning, good everything, who just immediately hit activate on a plan to figure out, okay, what do we do when we come out of this? And you would assume that when when the world sort of starts to to, to ramp up again. Um, it's going to be the most competitive environment you could mm. ever imagine. Like when one, so many people, so many companies are going to be behind the ball, like as financially. So they're like, we have to make this up. We have to come out really aggressively. Um, they've had all this time to just plot and figure out what the landscape is going to be like and what they're going to do. And they're just going to come out guns blazing. The other, the other half are going to just show up. Like you've walked out of a cave after hibernation, like you're in beer and spring, like just, this is this, what the sunlight looks like. Oh, and just be blown. It's, it's like a, um, there's some great cartoon. I can't remember what it is. Some great thing. Like with a bear coming out of hibernation and through the winter, like they built like a highway right in front of your cave and they just like walk out just like into like, into crazy traffic. People have, I mean, people have short memories about this stuff, but they have very long emotions. They'll remember the feeling that went with it and people's behaviors will change pretty pretty dramatically like it's pretty hard to imagine 
as an example, that once you've got used to doing your shopping, your grocery shopping online, that you'd ever go back to the bloody supermarket again. So like, think, yeah, but behaviors like that, but even just the behavior of being like, uh, of realizing that someone else is in charge of you, someone else can tell you what to do, that there's such a thing as a state of emergency, that the idea that you have freedoms around these things is is still just a construct that you live inside and the way that people will respond to that will be, I think will be really interesting. So yeah, we might forget in a year's time, we might've forgotten the details of this, but we'll definitely remember the behaviors. The feeling that people have that they're constrained is this immense one. It's just this wild thing of people feeling locked down at home when any other time, if you were like, Hey, you can, you can, you can work from home for like a month. Everyone else, if you weren't forced to, people would be like, holy shit, that's great, yeah, you know? And then suddenly when you're forced mm-hmm. to do it, um, everyone's like, this is a disaster, I'm sick of it. So it, there's a lot of things around the, the way people perceive freedom and liberty and stuff like that, which is which is kind of going to mess with them a little bit. Um, but yeah, I don't even know. I'm just ranting. I don't even know what I'm talking about here. Like. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this conversation we're having with Sai at the moment. There's plenty more gold nuggets coming up, but just wanted to let you know if you're looking at finding him online, you can find him on sassmore.com, also baileyandmore.com, and he's on Instagram and Facebook, check him out. But he also has a heap of resources and other podcasts where he dives more specifically into the photography world. So if you want to check those out, you can, um, we'll list some links below where you can check him out. But other than that, enjoy the rest of the show. One really cool thing that you've put together recently and you've just posted on your Instagram page is a collection of thoughts from creatives around the country and around the world. Um, I don't, is it Zine or Zine? It's Zine. 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 It's just like a throw. It's a throwback to like throwback to like the nineties when like you know indie indie kid bands would photocopy <laughs> bad things and staple them together and hand them out at shows well, it's like. A- it's a, a really great read. Um, so you've collated thoughts from, in this first edition, um, The New Thing. Um, there's seven guests. And one thing that uh, Greta has said, Greta Kenyon from the Together Kenyon, Journal, yeah. um, one quote is, I firmly believe you should not try and compete with other companies. To do so is to take your eye off your own goals and to waste much needed creative energy. And I love that thought. And maybe you can expand on it a bit more based on the conversation you've had with her. But I guess a whole lot of people coming out of this will will instantly start looking at other creative people and think, okay, they're doing this and I'm just going to have to do what they're doing, but slightly better. Or, you know, when, when you start a business, all you do is look at everyone's Instagram page, everyone's website and go, okay, this is the template. I just need to do that and I need to do it slightly better than the next person so I get the business. I love what she's saying. Don't look at that and waste your time and just sort of focus on your own creativity. Yeah, totally. I mean, one, Grit is a legend. Right? She started, um, she was a photographer, is a photographer, great photographer herself. And she started a magazine. She wanted to just start a globally significant, like, wedding magazine in New Zealand, you know, but that looked like that looked like something beautiful and international, which really didn't exist at that time, a few years ago. And she just got on and, did it you know um you look at the advertisers that she has at the quality of the magazine at how far it's distributed around the world and i think she's learned that you know when you come into a market uh and you shake up you shake up some other people who were kind of doing a similar thing but not very well like people just get real pissed off and start throwing shade at you and i think she learned early on and creative people are really good at being defensive, right? That's the first thing that they usually do when, you know, they're like, someone stole my idea. It's just like, yo, like no one's got ownership of ideas here. Like grow up, you know? It's like if you, if a competitor comes up behind you and does a thing better than you, that really should just be a reminder that you should just get your, get your ass in the gear and figure out some better ways of doing things, right? There's a lot specifically, I think, in the creative industries that like we, we people just get defensive about ideas, you know? Oh, I did this. I did that shot. I did that thing. I told that story. I had this. It's like, did you? What Greta's talking about though is, um, it's it's from the privileged position of when you when you're a leader, 
you, you're, you're looking at fresh road in front of you. You're looking at, 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 at clear space. You know, you're not behind someone else. If you start looking over your shoulder or if you start worrying about who's coming up behind you or you start worrying about what other people are doing, what you stop doing is you start you start responding to, to other people as opposed to just planning, getting your plan. And there's always there's always a time to respond to competitors. There's always time to, to ha- take good stock of what you're doing and figure out how change works, you know, and when you need to change. But... The majority of your energy should be in planning and plotting your own path. This is what you're doing with your life. You're literally spending your life on this. Like like you have a finite amount of life in a wallet and you are every day spending this stuff on what you're doing. You're spending your life doing this. If this is not what you want to do, then do something else. If this is what you want to do, then spend it very deliberately, like figure out exactly how you're doing this. And it's a real bummer to spend your life looking over your shoulder um, being afraid of someone coming up behind you Mm. or feeling inferior to, to, to someone else doing something. Just... If you want to do this with your life, figure out how how you can do it in your unique way, how you can do it incredibly well, and then sit down and just plan that arc. A business is a ship under sail, you know. It's like it takes a lot of tweaking constantly to keep it moving. A lot of changes of direction, a lot of tacking, a lot of. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty great analogy slash metaphor slash simile, whichever of those things you want. Yeah, it's never a straight line. Yeah, and 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 you you're gonna. So long as you know where you're going, eventually you're going to get there, and it's going to be a very different, probably a very different path to what a lot of other people take. But you'll get there. You'll just, you'll eventually get there. Hey, it's uh, Future Josh here. Just wanted to jump in and say that you can download and read this design that we're talking about with Sai right now. If you go to baileymore.com forward slash on, you'll be able to uh, find the link for that and download it for yourself. But let's get back to the conversation with Sai. One thing I, I loved is uh, the video that's been put together about. You know, what, what Bailey and Moore is all about. There was a moment when we first started shooting together 10 years ago where we stopped trying to capture a story and we just embraced being alongside two people having a wild experience together. And then our aesthetic, how we see the world in colour and tone and shape and light, it all started to make sense in the context of these beautiful love stories that we were in the room with. It all clicked. We're just here with the people, seeing on their behalf, being alongside it all as it unfolds. And there's a line in there which I love. It's, um, you said, uh, it's about being alive. Because uh, it's such a, such a great thought to be able to find your space where you're actually alive. You need to somehow marry that with some sort of commercial exchange. And so um, how, how is it that we can actually marry what we are, uh, what we feel called to do to be alive, but then turn that into some sort of commercial exchange where we can actually live by being alive? It's really what you're talking about is like the, the, the like who's your audience for the thing that you're making or the service you're providing mm. or um, and and who and who are you and how do you talk to your audience? You know how do you how do you find your audience? How do you how do you what's the relationship between between you and your audience so that they that they give you money for the thing that you do um, and they feel happy about it and you feel happy mm. about the thing you're making for them and the 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 currency exchange in the middle is kind of like hey this is only natural that this would happen you know it's like when someone yeah. shows up like shows up with an ice cream truck in your street and everyone's just like I, the money the currency exchange is nothing it's just like give me the ice cream like i need the ice this is thank goodness that you came down our street because we were in a desperate situation can you imagine ice cream trucks in the age of the lockdown one bad for the bubble but two like holy shit, that stuff would go off in our street right now it would be mental like we've just got mm. we live in a dead end street there's kids playing in the street you know on their skateboards doing whatever ice cream truck shows up boom and also burger burger truck anyway i think that the big question is like who's your audience for your stuff how do you find your audience and how do you give them what they want because like people there's this idea sometimes in business that you try to trick people out of money you know you've got to convince people to buy stuff which is is like if i think if it feels like that you're doing the wrong thing like with what we do we have spent years trying to figure out like what we love the kind of stuff that we love like how we like how we love to tell stories and and what the look of those stories is and and how we love to shoot and the kind of 
experience that we love people to have so that we can capture that and what it feels. And so we've found our people, like our people are a certain kind of certain kind of people, a certain kind of couple who experience things in a certain way and they love a certain aesthetic, you know. And we've found that we love the same stuff as our audience. And in fact, all it means is that we've just found our people. We've found people who love mm. the same music as us. They love the same – they read the same – art books you know they reference the same photographers they are often makers themselves who are in the creative industries and they, you know they are our people and so when we do what comes naturally to us just we just do what we love we don't have to have a facade we don't have to see and guess ourselves we don't have to think what would the client like we just do what we love and we found our audience who also loves the same thing we've got this perfect situation so you used to you used to split your time quite a bit between uh, Auckland here in, in NZ and uh, in the US, right? You used to spend your off-season in the US. Are you still doing – well, you, you obviously can't do it now, but up until now, was that still the case? Yeah, we, we would do like the southern summer here in Australia and like the islands and then the northern summer like US and Europe. Um, and I think over the last few years we've, we've been keen to slow that down. One, because like it, it, take, it definitely takes its toll, like you're shooting like a double – this constant double summer which you know is um can be hard on the body and hard on the mind and you're just going hard all the time a lot of that was about trying to find the rhythm for us which was the right amount of work to be doing that kind of makes you feel like yeah we're working at the right pace like we like we have a saying that like you, you know if you want to be good at this then just do whatever you do so that you're still doing it in 10 years you have to just figure mm. out how you can still be doing it and what's the amount that we can be shooting that we can be doing that we feel like we're still thriving and loving it not just crawling across the finish line all the time another thing another big consideration is the reason why we've kind of tried to, we're trying to slow down the travel although it's now being slowed down for us it's just at a sustainable sustainability level it's just constantly flying around the world is terrible like and if if a big business was doing it, if a big corporate was doing it, we'd be like, hey, where's your sustainability policy? But, you know, small businesses don't get a free ride. You're just like, hey, figure out, like, our our carbon footprint is terrible because we are, we're moving around the world, like, at a crazy rate, you know, two people running a small business, burning up tons and tons of CO2. So we were like, we need to figure out a more responsible way to do this. And and a lot of that is just it's just been us addressing the false economy of status and and how that works with the idea that you have an international business, you know, the idea that you that you're traveling all the time. You're, I mean, you know, it's just like everyone like everyone in our part of the world is just like, whoa, it's so cool, you're shooting weddings in Italy. But like in Italy, they're just it's just normal weddings. So it's, you know, it's mm. just like you just got to put the sword through the status to go, okay, like it's not good for the planet. It's, it's maybe not even good for us to travel so much. How do you how do you come to grips in your own head, in your own business, and in your own heart with the fact that status is bullshit? You know, it'll all even out. The destination wedding game is 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 really interesting. You've got a whole lot of people flying around the world. Some with the right work visa for the country they're in. Most not with the right work visa. I don't know if anyone's got visas for Bolivia. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, there's a certain romance about being from somewhere else. Like we always talk about that factor that often with destination wedding stuff, the thing that we bring is obviously some people love your work, but there's so many people with great work everywhere, you know, and everyone's work doesn't look that different. I don't know, you know. I think as you get more experience, the thing that you have is – you have consistency. So you've figured out your voice you, and you can show up on a bad day when things aren't going your way and everything's falling apart and gone to shit and you can still get the same result. That's experience. So experience mm. just means that you get more consistent, I think. Bro, um, hey, look, we've taken up more than enough of your time and um, and I feel like I've just been sitting here um, drinking honey from a beehive. <laughs> Not being, not getting stung or anything. Wow. But hey, bro, we really appreciated your time, man. It's been just so good. So there you have it, everyone. That was our conversation with Cy Moore from Bailey and Moore. Man, he just wants to. Um, it, it just makes you want to get out there and be more creative and start, you know, doing your own thing and not necessarily being so confined to what the world expects of you. Mm. Um, and I just love it. He, so he's such a freeing personality. 
um, and really encouraging. So if you're watching, I hope you, that you were encouraged by this. If you are a creative in the photography game, even if it's a little bit more uh, wider reach in terms of the creative community, you might be an artist, you might be a potter, you might be a knitter. We hope that you were encouraged by that. Lumed Live is a thing now on the internet. We've committed to these episodes. Hopefully we can keep the ball rolling. We actually have about seven guests already pre-booked and lined up for the show. So stay mm. tuned and follow us on Facebook. Follow us on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. We would love more followers on YouTube, by the way. If you're over on Facebook and you don't follow us on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Peace out and we will see you in the next one.